Welcome everybody back to Veil of Sound. I am very happy to have this man here on the show because if the earth was a fair and just place, he would become as famous as Aina did with Vadruna. I'm very happy to have Mark oh, wow. Deeks here on Mark Deeks here on the show. Thanks for joining, Mark. That's a really kind thing to say. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah, you're welcome. It's just my true and honest opinion. Uh, before anybody asks, Mark is the mastermind and, on the record, not completely solo uh, performer, but uh, most of the stuff. He is a mastermind behind ARF. And um, they released, already a long time ago this year in 2024, they released a wonderful record, or he released a wonderful record, called Untouched by Fire, out on Prophecy Productions. First of all, shout out to our friend Guna, who, who does the label and everything. Um, Mark, mm, we always first ask, what is the band, shirt, merch, that you would like to drop today. And I see that you're wearing something. Uh, so before you go, I go and say, Great Faults, American noise rock from the Northwest. Just saw them two days ago. Amazing band. What are you supporting today? I am supporting today a classic new wave of British heavy metal, Tigers of Pantone, sure. oh. who, were, who were from Newcastle of Pantone. Um, their album, Wild Cat. So it is at the same time also uh, like local support because you are yeah. from, uh, but you're not from Newcastle itself, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm from Newcastle upon Tiny Ridge. That's my, that's my home city, yeah. I just live a little outside now. Okay. Um, so for everybody out there who might not be familiar with, is it Old English, Arf? Is that Old English already? So I understand that it's a p particular to the dialect of Northumbria, which is the region of England. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I consulted a, someone with more linguistics knowledge than I about about the word. So yes, it's an old Northumbrian word from the sort of Anglo-Saxon era of, of uh, English history. And it means native land, doesn't it? That's right. Yeah, my native land. Yeah. And there we are already. Why I draw this comparison to Vadruna? I would say that. What Aina has done for for Norse, not mythology, but for Norse music, um, it's not the same as what you are doing in Arf musically. But I think it has a similar, a similar context, historically similar, and maybe also intentionally a little bit. Yeah, I mean, for anyone who has not followed anything that I've done over the years, that the th common thread that runs through it is often, you know, an interest in how musicians represent where they're from. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we can look at that in a classical context, for example, Sibelius with Finlandia, we can look at it in a, a metal context um, with, you know, a, the plethora of Nordic bands that have, have uh, Vodruna being a, a great example, um, you know, the Irish bands like Primordial, you know, the Eastern European bands like Drugged and so on. There's just a uh, there's been a huge explosion, particularly in the last forty years, of rock and metal musicians yeah. incorporating elements of where they're from in their work, and so that was really the sort of starting point for art. Yeah, and when when I said like you were also working in a similar time frame, correct me if I'm wrong, but now with a new record or with the latest record. Um, with Untouched by Fire, you even step back a few decades because the first one was focused on Lindis Farm, right? So something like 657. Yeah, yeah, and, and Cuthbert. Yeah, St. Cuthbert, yeah. And, and now you're moving even a few decades before that, aren't you? Our lives do uh, overlap, uh, or did overlap. Um, but yeah, it's not, you know, I'm not constructing a timeline from record to record as such. Although in the instance of these two characters, they, their, their uh, timelines do overlap. It's just purely, um, you know, significant characters um, from the history history of this region. And when, when we talk about, you know, Cuthbert and Oswald, um, can you can you show a few moments where you say, look, okay, they, they are 
constituting elements of Northumbrian lore? I mean, so in the case of Cuthbert, his name is uh, imprinted on a, a lot of this region. You know, you see roads that are called Cuthbert, churches, schools, even a, a, a well-known local charity um, um, as Cuthbert, um, as is St. Oswald's Hospice, you know, Oswald from the, the first one. So um, their names are really intrinsically linked uh, in, into Northeast English cu culture. Cuthbert, in particular, uh, the character on the, uh, whose life is t told in the first album, um, Lindisfarne, where he was a, a hermit at the end of his life and a monk at the end of his life, is a hugely important sort of tourist location. Um, Holy Island of Lindisfarne, it's the location where the, the Vikings first landed in England and so on. Um, and the, his remains uh, are still to this day in what we now know as Durham Cathedral, which is, again, a hugely significant location in England. So, um, yeah, Cuthbert's certainly imprinted on the Northeast in many ways. And like I say, same for Oswald. Um, so Oswald's, one of his, I guess you could say, main impacts on England is that he was a very significant character in bringing Christianity to England. Um, so when he was a young boy, he, the, I mean, we have very little in the way of text of this uh, uh, from that p time period, but from what we can deduce, um, Oswald, as a young boy, f fled to uh, the album of Iona off the west coast of Scotland with his mother and brothers. Um, because his, I think his paternal uncle was on on the rampage, um, and uh, there, Chris, uh, learnt, um, discovered Christianity, converted to Christianity as a young man. Also became a, a, sol a prevalent soldier, fought for various sort of tribes around that west coast of Scotland and into across the Ireland um, region. And when he came back to Northumbria to sort of conquer his homeland and become king. He was, we think, around sort of 27, 28 years old. Um, and he brought Christianity back with him and, um, you know, requested um, a translator from Iona to help him travel around Northumbria and, um, oh, sorry, he requested a bishop to help him travel around Northumbria and convert the locals. But because he'd learned Christianity um, from, from an Irish dialect, a Celtic sort of origin, uh, no one spoke the language. So he had to become the, the translator for the bishop. So Aidan, who was another significant Northeast character, was a bishop who you know, converted Northumbria, a lot of Northumbria to Christianity. And King Oswald acted as his translator because he could speak both. Um, so yeah, both of their, their histories have had huge impact in, in what we now consider sort of significant moments in English history. So we're also basically talking about figures of English history who um, are right on, on that verge, are right on that little red line between a, a pagan or, I don't know, no, I would say a pagan uh, society probably, right, and and a, an early Christian society. Um, how many remains of, like, pre-Christian uh, society do you still find, you know, in your region? So it's really difficult for me to sort of really get into the depths of this because I I don't come from a historical background. It's it, uh, it's I might sound strange to say it, having given my previous answer. I, I'm not a specialist in this area. I kind of research yeah. what I want to research mm -hmm. for the albums. Yeah. And I, I feel like I'm sort of learning as I go. And actually, actually, I sort of I laugh because I used to be a lecturer, and I remember sort of someone early in my lecturing career sort of saying, you know, as long as you're one step ahead of the students, you're fine, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I feel like, like that with art interviews. I'll, I'll yeah. openly, honestly, and say, you know, like Gunnar, for example, that you mentioned, who does PR for Prophecy. Yeah. He knows way more about this subject than I do. And he, I often use him as a fact checker when I'm researching <laughs> the, the things that I'm putting together. So, yeah, um, yeah we, I, you, you could certainly write in saying that it's a, around the time that we are sort of seeing elements of English history that was pre-Christian starting to... Um, not be wiped out, but starts starting to be lost. Of yeah. course, we had had the the Roman um, period around Northumbria yeah. um, a century or two earlier, um, where which we now have Hadrian's Wall, uh, the remains of Hadrian's Wall, and so on. And so we see that in local museums about um, different sort of cultural um, imprints that you see on the sort of decoration of Hadrian's Wall and uh, and locations across that 
that distance. So, um, yeah, it's certainly starting to be a dividing line in English history for sure. Mm. Would you would you consider yourself like a local histor historian, or would you say I'm still a local musician? First oh, I'm foremost. very much a musician, like musician by a mile. Like it's not <laughs> even it's not even close. It it's is an in, it's a, it's an interest, an yeah. interest in this element of what, as I said before, you know how musicians can represent where they're from. Mm -hmm. I want Arth will never be anything other than he, a reflection of Northumbria. Mm -hmm. um, but no, this is a, a and a comparative recent interest. You know, my PhD, I, which I finished in was it like twenty sixteen maybe, um, that involved me starting to develop my interest. So it took taken me seven years to write that. So around that sort of twenty two thousand nine to two thousand sixteen period was where I was starting to develop this interest. But oh, absolutely one million percent I'm a musician with an interest in the history rather rather than the other way around. Well we'll talk about your PhD book in a in a moment, but let's stick to the music. Um I've somewhere in the in the promo stuff that we got, I've read the very interesting description of monastic doom. <laughs> and I was like, uh huh. Why not just call it funeral doom? Um, would you make a difference between that, between funeral doom and monastic? Yeah, very much. So, cool. so, so the first thing to say is that monastic doom was not my idea. <laughs> I, I thought so. I thought so. Uh, and I also think we both know who thought. About yes, it. yes, we do. Um, <laughs> But but you know I I, un I understood why it was you know useful to as a yeah. you know music fans like we like labels don't we to understand what's going on in, um, in the music that we like or at least helps us to direct direct our interest, yeah it's, it? I sometimes hate that part of, of this job but I I know what you mean yes yeah. music it's fans a like that. necessary evil sometimes don't yeah we? pigeonholes right yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um so would I distinguish between monastic doom and funeral doom yeah absolutely because um. Primarily the vocals. Mm. So, I, you know, I'm a fan of many death doom, funeral doom bands of that kind of ilk, where you know the extreme vocals often play a quite central role. You know, I'm thinking of bands like Shape of Despair or Skepticism, for example. Um, and I absolutely cannot sing like that. Like much as I've spent the last thirty years wishing I could, I, I can't. And so. One of the earliest sort of debates, internal debates I had with Arth was, you know, what's the vocals going to be like? Because my obsession is actually vocal harmonies. I've run yeah. choirs for 25 years. So I, you know, my earliest musical loves were bands where harmonies were a, a huge part of it. So, you know, for example, two of my absolute all time earliest f formative bands were Alice in Chains and, yes, the 70s prog band. Um, that's that's kind of very different okay. bands, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but th but those are two of my all time bands, uh, and the the link in my ears is you know the, the use ex extensive use of vocal harmonies, and I think that's probably oh, yeah. where okay. yeah pro probably where my interest first came from, and so when it came to what are the vocals of art going to sound like, there was only really ever one answer for me. It was going to have lots of vocal harmonies, and I've got a low sort of baritone voice, and so. Um, there were one or two records that I felt amalgamated those two interests, um, and I did debate about whether to guess, uh, get a guest vocalist to you know sporadically sprinkle some extreme vocals on, um, but I knew that that wasn't what I really wanted to do. So, yeah, obviously most funeral doom bands will tend to have some extreme vocals, and Arth has none, yeah. and yeah. I'm I'm comfortable with that. That's something that I also looked up. So you and you've already said that you've been conducting choirs and, and also, you know, your interest in, in choirs and, and choral music, stuff like that. Um was that also one of the driving forces for you to start ARF to see where you can take this? I think like I said uh, I was saying to you earlier that I I just wanted an expression of myself. And I've mm -hmm. I've led a very sort of compartmentalized life in many ways. Mm -hmm. In that, you know, I've been playing piano since I was five. I was teaching piano when I was fifteen years old, and well, and so piano is a very, like, it's as close to who I am as anything. Um, and so I know how deeply uncool piano can be to some metal fans. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. 
um, I was if it was going to be who I am, if I was going to create something that had all of the elements of who I am, then piano was going to be a very central thing. Choral mm -hmm. vocals was going to be a very central thing. Mm -hmm. But I'm a, a massive metal fan for the last 30 years. So I, found, I was wanting to find ways to incorporate some seemingly disparate influences into one thing. And I strangely remember exactly where I was when I figured it out. I was on holiday in Tenerife, of all places. Sound, Ste the record sounds completely like It sounds like absolutely Tenerife. nothing like Tenerife. Yeah, I, no, I, I can... I, I, I you know see where, you there lying in the shade, you know, like... Yeah, yeah that's exactly what I was doing. I was staring <laughs> at the sea, listening to my listening to some music. And what a band that I hugely love is a band called Tenhi, the New York yeah. folk band. Yes. And I love the way they use piano in that. It's just really dark and atmospheric, and I find it quite emotional music to listen to. I, I think they're a really special band. And But I also really love stuff like uh, Morning Beloveth and that kind of like slow, crushing doom thing. So I was just sort of mulling over the, as I as I had a few days off, finally, um, and mulling over how I could make these things come together. And Arthur's what came out. It's very. Uh, I I try to get my head around you probably sitting there listening to very many low in the back like Copacabana or stuff like that. No, and yeah, that, yeah, that was not happening. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what you. That, that's what you're saying now. I was just um, in Tenhi, and that's cool. <laughs> it, it is. It definitely it, for everybody. Um, if if you if you need to find out um, one of the most influential Scandinavian, I think Scandinavian, right? Scandinavian uh, neo folk art. Artists and, and projects, you should listen to Tenhi. Um, yeah, they're a, they're a special band. I mean, I could even yeah, I can throw other things into the mix. So there's a funeral album called From These Wounds, mm. which I think is a deeply special record that no doesn't get talked about very much. Um, I, even to the point where I, I'm less keen on most of their the rest of their catalog, but I think that's a truly special record. And Cowan K A U A N. Sony Nai, S O R N I N A I. Deeply special records. Th those are the building blocks of art. When listening to the new record, it struck me that to me, I had two bands that immediately came to my mind when I listened to Untouched by Fire. Um, one was Pantheist, and the other was Aha. I'm very sure that you know, as as much as we try to stay away from being influenced from stuff, are these bands that you listen to? So obviously, Costas plays piano. Uh, Costas from Pantheus plays piano for me. Yeah, in I the didn't want to get to that already, but okay, you go on. Yeah, yeah so uh, yeah, you know, he's 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 a good friend of mine, and I'm, I'm yeah. very fond of him. I, I don't think Costas would mind me saying like I wouldn't. I've previously included Pantheus as like one of my absolute all-time favorite Doom bands. Although I do enjoy their records, I, I think he's I think he's very creative in how he puts his music together. But um, I would say a Doom band that I, I was actually less familiar with than some other ones um, until perhaps more recent years. Um, Ahab, I think that I really enjoyed the first couple of Ahab records. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, less so where where it's gone in more recent years, but yeah, the first two Ahab records, sure, uh, I think they're really great. Yeah. Um, also interesting is who who mastered the record, who who recorded, mixed, and mastered it, because that was Marcus from Imperium. So yeah. my question is, did you go to his studio or did he yeah. fly to England? No, I flew to his studio for two weeks. Okay. Uh, because it was. It, this will demonstrate my absolute geeky side of per perfectionism because the reason I wanted Mark I the reason I wanted Marcus to record this record was because of the drum sound on the last Imperium record, mm -hmm. which I think is absolutely exquisite. Um, I mean, I, don't get me wrong; I think it's a fantastic record in its entirety, but I think the drum recording is truly special. And so, um, when I heard the last Imperium record, I thought. Oh, wouldn't you? It would be amazing to get that drum sound on, on an Arth record. Um, so, obviously... And as you know somebody, who knows Marcus? Yeah, yeah. you can know. The, the, the Prophecy Connection helped there. So, yeah, I, I went uh, I went and spent two weeks in the studio with, with Marcus, mm -hmm. which was, you know, an, as an Imperium fan, you could imagine a, a really special experience. Yeah. And 
did he already know Arf from the first record or was he a novice? I don't, I don't think so. I think he perhaps heard it in passing, but I don't think he was deeply familiar. But I think once he sort of started doing his homework in the run-up to recording, um, he said some nice things, which was lovely. And you were like, oh, tell me more, tell me more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, is, uh, what is striking me always when I listen to such highly layered and very fine interwoven records like untouched by fire or also like the first record um how do you go about writing those things what comes first the melody or the lyrics music or let's put or it like the music or or the lyrics music always okay not even close i don't think okay. i've ever written a lyric first in my life um it's always music first i write on the piano predominantly Mm -hmm. um, I did that more for Take Up My Bones, the first record, than, mm -hmm. than this one. Uh, this was a little bit more guitar-driven. I, I think I wanted to make it perhaps, a, for want of expression, perhaps a little bit more of an aggressive record, a little bit, a little bit darker mm -hmm. record. Yeah. Um, but predominantly, yeah, I've been playing piano all my life, so piano will often be a central starting point, um, which kind of lends itself to that kind of layering thing straight away. And because you're sort of capable, you're able to do so many things simultaneously on piano that you can't necessarily do on guitar, yeah. um, and also because of my, you know, obsession with with choral stuff that we've spoken about. So, yeah, it's always music first to the point where it's kind of like a game of Tetris, a jigsaw trying to put the whole album together. So I will have an idea in my mind about the story arc of the character that it's going to be about, but I will simultaneously write several pieces of music at the same time mm -hmm. so i'll have three or four songs under development and because it's just me doing it sat here um i can sort of constantly return to that song and and for this record it was very much sort of a cyclical i think i'd like another go at that one today i think i'd like another go at that one today see where that one goes so i wasn't writing one song in its entirety and then moving on to the next one and so i had a number of pieces taken shape at the same time, but all of which had no lyrics. But what I'll tend to do is I'll tend to start getting an idea about which sections are going to have vocals in, and I will just hum melodies, and or mm -hmm. sometimes just make just make noises like vowel sounds or whatever mm -hmm. to see what sort of starts to fit. Yeah. Build some harmonies up like that, and I can end up with fully harmonized vowel sounds with no lyrics. And it's only the one the lyrics tend to be a, a sort of a much later down the line. Once, I, once I've decided what order the pieces of music are going to go in, I kind of let the music that. drive it. You know, this piece yeah. of music sounds like it might be the opener. This piece of music sounds like yeah. it might be the yeah. album yeah. closer yeah. and so on. Right, if that's the case in the story arc, where are the key points during the story arc? Well, Oswald is doing this. It's track one. It's this at track two and, yeah. and so on. This thematically sounds better. Yeah, I, I can see that. And then... Um, do the lyrics take a longer period of time for you to write than the music? Or is it? Long, I don't know about longer. They're harder. <laughs> um, I mean, the music has so many layers to it. It's a huge, hugely time consuming process for sure. Yeah. Um, the lyrics, I tend to sort of try and pull from text or websites or trying to try to come up, you know, just spot phrases that, that catch my eye. I mean, the the um, title of um, the first track, "Curse to Nothing But Patience," mm -hmm. was a phrase used on a website, and I actually can't find the website with it on. I made an I made a note of it when I was reading some some story about Oswald, and I was like, "Oh, cursed to nothing but patience." That's a, that's quite. A, it was literally, and he was cursed to nothing but patience in a sentence, and um, I don't think I've told anyone that before. You got an exclusive, so. Um, yeah, it's just a case of sort of trying to find phrases that, you, that catch my eye or, um, you know, like a lot of musicians, I guess, a thesaurus is your friend and yeah, off you go down the rabbit hole. Yeah, that's something that we very often hear and where I'm always wondering, like, how, how big is the rabbit hole if <laughs> a grown man like you and I could fix, you know? Okay. <laughs> um, something... That is striking about the record because it sounds, it sounds, to be honest, some parts of it sound as if you 
found somewhere an old um an an, an old note where it's like okay or another note like um how do you say that uh, an old written piece of paper and it has some music on it it sounds some parts of it sound very the sound is very modern but the, the way it's constructed it could be as if we're listening to the the, the monks in lindisfarne or somewhere else which is a hugely interesting thing um but you've said you know like okay you do these these choral works or this choir works do you think that all the experience you got doing this would it be possible to do this kind of music monastic doom would it be possible to do art without that experience of leading choirs writing that kind of music it's an interesting question i don't think anyone's ever asked me that one before i yeah, think that's what i try to do i think it's certainly fed into it um, yeah, you said you wanted to combine everything, right? Yeah, I think, you know, because I said I, when I first started listening to bands that had harmonies in, I would, or even without harmonies, I remember as a, as a teenager singing along to records, but singing my own harmonies, like not singing the melody. So I've always kind of had an ear for it. Um, Did you then also a, do your own lyrics? No, lyrics are much harder. <laughs> But um, yeah, I remember doing that as a teenager, and I think that obviously that was pre-running choirs. But I've been running choirs since I was about twenty, and I've just turned forty-seven. So I ca I think it's kind of, and I've arranged because I write all the arrangements for all the choirs that I've worked with. So I've written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of choir arrangements over the years, and I think it would be daft to think that that hadn't fed into the sound of, of art somehow, but only in a sort of intangible way, perhaps, rather than anything concrete. And I know that you do the lead and the backing vocals on, or most of the backing vocals on the record. So do you then record a new layer, a new layer, a new layer, or do you just double, triple, quadruple it for the backing well, vocals for, well, for the harmonies? <laughs> both. Um, so on, on Take Up My Bones, for example, every harmony was triple tracked by me and triple tracked by Dan, um, which, you know, took a long time, as you can imagine. Um, I think in, in Untouched by Fire, we double tracked some things, triple tracked others. I, it was kind of more of a 60-40 split towards me on this one in the, um, it didn't feel like it needed quite as much on this one, um, for clarity's sake. But yeah, most there's a slight emphasis towards my voice, but I want it's helpful to have another voice in there just to give that extra sort of choral effect. Mm -hmm. Um, something that that came to my mind was a simple question about the the motif behind it. You've mm -hmm. already said that you tried to to show. Northum the roots of Northumbrian culture, for so to speak. But this is not a kind of escapism game, right? It's like, I'm not trying to escape reality. I'm more of like maybe showing where we're from, more of like connecting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I consider it shining a light on mm -hmm. and and maybe sort of poking the bear a little bit, as we'd say in English, and like the expression to sort of challenge a little yeah. bit about the established narrative. Yeah. Did you notice that? Did you notice any the way that you say that? I got to pick that up. Did you notice any narratives where you say like, ah, that is not quite right? Well, per, it's kind of a personal thing. This element of of art in that. So I come from a very religious family. My whole mm -hmm. family are extremely Christian, um, and so that's that's how I was raised. But as a teenager, I quite sort of quickly deduced this wasn't for me. Um, and so I've kind of lived with the, what I always sort of think of as a healthy respect for religion in that, um, I don't intrinsically have a problem with religion unless it's sort of forced upon anyone. And uh, if it's a sort of an, an internal personal conversation about how someone views the world and wants to live their life, then I don't really have any problem with that. Um, mm -hmm. but when people sort of aggressively start forcing it on others, I have a real problem with it. And so I think that. Certainly in this region of England, there is a, 
an emphasis on the sort of Christianity that stemmed from that time period that we've that I've talked about in the first two records. Yeah. That I think you know, for so the example I often give is that you know, Oswald is presented in the few texts that we have as a very righteous, holy man who, um, you know, sh- sh- should be praised because he was, a, you know, a good Christian man, doing, yeah. and he wouldn't he wouldn't do any bad things, and he's come to save Northumbria from these bad pagans. Yeah. That's kind of the sort of very simplistic view of how his 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 um his role in things is is, is um, perceived and presented, but when Oswald dies in battle he dies we think in a place called oswest which is now known as oswestry and which means oswald's tree and that is just inside the welsh border mm-hmm. which is a long way from northumbria now northumbria was a lot yeah. bigger at that time than it is now but I'm trying it's, to get my know, geography straight but yes well like... it's, it's diagonally across the country and down yeah. a long way there's um, there the whole liverpool manchester area between, yes yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. okay so, so the question I sort of wryly ask is, what was he doing down there in a the battle? Well, yeah, it's it's at least possible that he was trying to take over someone else's turf, which doesn't sound like a very righteous thing to do. So, I I, I don't have any answers for this because it's not my special subject. But I think there's an underlying um, suggestion that it's whether or about this subject or other subjects, healthy to question what is presented as. Um, as fact, what we should question what is healthy. Uh, mm-hmm. We should have a healthy tendency to question what is presented as fact in, in, in media and news and our parents and our families and our culture. You know, if, to come to our own in, individual conclusions rather than just going. You know, it's it's the classic phrase of what who, who controls history is the person who sort of writes yeah. the writes the book, right? Yeah, and it's also interesting to see how long it takes. In order for for history to be changed, uh, some people will know being a history teacher. So, I still remember when I was in seventh grade, and we talked about the Middle Ages. Uh, Charlemagne, Charles the Great, here in Germany, was untouchable. You know, like the guy who brought Christianity to to the central regions of Europe, and especially Germany, and um, who was the first German emperor crowned in 800 by a vicious pope who malignantly put the crown onto his head. So that was like 30, 30 some years ago when I was taught that in history. And now we try to look at it from a very different point of view and say like, okay, he might have been a great warrior, a great general. But come on, he told the Saxons, you know, either get baptized or die. Doesn't sure. sound so great. Mm-hmm. It's interesting when you talk about narratives. And I think here we could come to a certain book that you wrote, your <laughs> PhD book. And mm-hmm. for everybody out there, first of all, you know, this might be, I think you're the second uh, PhD person I have here on the show. If anybody knows who the first one is, then. You're a good one. Um, you, the, na- the name of your book is National Identity in Northern and Eastern European Heavy Metal. First mm. of all, how did you come up with a topic? I mean, very simplistic, uh, simply, again, it's just an interest. You know, it's, I, I, f- I started to notice how a lot of the bands that I loved um, were talking about historical elements i started to sort of wonder what the appeal of it was not that i didn't like it i loved a lot of these bands but why is this appealing um i think that uh, again this sort of questioning of the narrative that's presented to us as someone who's read thousands and thousands of album reviews in, in my life when when people use expressions like um such and such a band has a finnish sound or a Norwegian melody or sounding melody or whatever. I'm just thinking how often I've said shit like that. Yeah. Okay, but go on, please. My, my, I, I kind of used to think, well, what does that mean? Because yeah. I'm a music theoret- theoretician. Like, I've been a musician all my life. I was taught music yeah. theory as a child. So my music theory brain would sort of challenge it and go, what on earth is a Finnish sound? Even though as a fan, I was going, yeah, I can totally spot a Finnish band a mile off. So I kind of started to have these sort of internal sort of 
geek-like conversations with myself. Um, and so I, I knew that I wanted to sort of write something. If I was going to do a PhD about this subject, I wanted to, I mean, it's a, it's a music PhD, and that's kind of what earned it its PhD status in that it was done under the School of Music, and apparently I was the first person to sort of write about these subjects and, and, and look at the musical content. So the, the first few chapters are very much history, nationalism, um, national romanticism in art, old mythology, poetry, and so on. But then the second half of it is more about a, a musical challenge, right? Let's look at some of these bands. Let's look at some of these melodies. Because I know, as a music theory person, I used to lecture in music theory, that there are only 12 notes, right? If there are only 12 notes, the chances that we've somehow got this um, blind in a blind test, you'd be able to spot a finished band. Is kind. Of, I'm not saying it's not 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 possible, but it's kind of interesting how true that might might be. And I think that I sort of was trying to su suggest the conclusion is that we receive a lot of these bands as what they are by by taking a um, a combination of pieces of information, not just one. So if if I take a band like say Moon Sorrow, for example. Who I think are a fantastic band. They're singing in Finnish, um, and if they have a painting on the cover that we say, "Oh, this is a you know mountain from that's a, from a particular region of Finland or whatever," or Vindia, for example, the, the mm -hmm. Norwegian band, where they've got specific locations on on the cover. If a band has a specific location on it, and, and we are told either in an interview or a review that that mountain is in Norway or that mountain is in Ireland. And then the band come along and sing. Well, in there Ireland. are not many mountains in Ireland. Let's put yeah, that yeah, yeah. Sorry, you take my point. <laughs> that we have, if a band sings in a particular language, uses imagery from a particular country, and we're, we're told is using old texts from that country, then we kind of, I think we're kind of just sort of led from a sort of semiotics point of view. This is the is this not the dullest yeah. metal interview you've ever heard in your life? Well, from a semiotics no, point of view, hey, for me, you're sort of, you're led down the path of, um, oh, well, I receive this as Finnish or I receive this as Norwegian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas if I told you that mountain was in, you know, somewhere else, my, you've received it as something else. So yeah. um, that, my PhD was kind of sort of challenging these notions and looking at issues of national identity and transnational identity and um, sort of challenging whether it really was true, I guess, particularly with regards to the term Viking metal, which I obviously tried to rip apart. <laughs> We'll talk about that in a moment. I think you've already hinted at it. You know, like even if a band sings in Finnish, even if a band sings in Swedish, even if a band sings sings in Lithuanian, for Christ's sake, as soon as it's a black metal band, nobody can tell me that he or she, without looking at the lyrics, understands that shit. No, sorry. Well, there was a concept that I wrote about in my PhD, which is, a, I think, like a sociological concept. Uh, I seem to remember that it was written by someone called Ralph Samuel or something. And the concept was called the romance of otherness. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of, it's something has an appeal because it's not our own. And, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a huge football fan. So sometimes uh, we hear football, football or soccer. Let's clear that up well, for our American well, friends. Well, soccer, because, but it is football, let's face it. Um, <laughs> we, we have, um, this kind of uh, narrative amongst football fans that if it's in England, an English manager gets treated differently to a, somebody who's not from England. And the, the foreign managers will sometimes have um, this kind of allure of like, oh, yeah, but they're, you know, he's he's a bit mystical and, and clever because he's Italian. Oh, or forgive Arsene because he's French. Yeah. All that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, so yeah, um, I think I kind of like challenging these sort of notions a little. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you say, um, first of all, I got to ask for please don't tell me you're a fan of Newcastle United. Well, of course, that's where I'm from. That's my team. I have black and white blood running through me. And I don't know. I, I still don't understand how you English could sell your souls to all those foreign investors. You know, like I, I mean, I didn't sell anything. I'm just here to try and enjoy the ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. But, you know, like, ah, uh, whatever. Uh, at least there is somebody who can challenge Man City. I'm mean, like, come on, price really. Well, if they let, if they let us break the rules in the same way as Man City, yes. <laughs> don't get me started. Let, no, let's not, 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 not go there. Let's not go there. You know, <laughs> being a member of Bayern Munich, you know, like yeah. that is a different podcast. <laughs> yeah, and a longer one. 
longer one, um, which also, by the way, shows in my choice of my favorite American football team because my American football team cannot move anywhere because it's not owned by one person. But anyway, um, there is something in the topic of your book that I think we should get straight before anybody tries to throw shit at us. Okay. You, and I, and I once again want to point that out to everybody who's listening with, you can look at topics like national identity, national romance music. You can even look at topics like nationalism mm -hmm. without being a nationalist, a supremacist, a fascist, whatever you want to call it. Well, yeah. Um, you, you point your, you, you give your point on that. Well, I couldn't agree more with you. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I can. Uh, I can write a book about murder without murdering someone. Yeah, very good, very good point of view. Um, or you know, even it, wanting to murder someone, like with, without any remote inclination to do that. Yeah, yeah. I can or, still, or I to can put it on a more cultural. Yeah, or to, to put it on a more cultural level, I could I could write a book on Shakespeare. I've I've taught so many Shakespeare classes. I've I've been to so many of his plays, but I still can't write like bloody Shakespeare. No. Never will. Um, however, um, did you? How should I say? When when writing this, did I, I'm very sure you also came across the wrong circle of bands, right? And when writing my in PhD? your book, in your book, yeah, yeah, yeah for your PhD, abs yeah, absolutely, yeah. I've been around did, metal long enough to to know that these bands exist. To be able to yeah. name you some of them and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and to be uncomfortable with what they do, but I, I can't stop them existing, and I can't. Stop, no, no, no. Of course not. I can't stop them being part of the spectrum of, of this topic. Mm -hmm. Did you then receive any kind of not reprimand, but did you did you receive any kind of praise for the book that you wrote, or do you say like, "Oh, that is so theoretical, nobody from that scene will give"? I mean. Gen genuinely speaking, and it's, it's not sort of, sort of to be self-deprecating. I, I don't know how many people have ever read my PhD. It's not in physical form. It's only available online. I would actually love to publish it as a book. Like, should anyone be able to help me do such a thing? Mm -hmm. But as is often the way with these things, you know, it is the academic property of the university. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a separate discussion. But I'd love to. But I, even if I did <laughs> release it as a book, I can't imagine it would sell more than about twenty copies anyway. So it's 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 such a niche thing. That would um, be not, niche merch. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, but in the after, no, in the aftermath of my PhD, I've never had anyone sort of. I think that's kind of a gr a great example of, of the, exactly the point that we're making. In that, I have had no grief whatsoever for writing a PhD about some of those subjects. No. But as soon as you set what people perceive to be the same thing to music. Then you start getting grief. Um, yeah, I mean, I had every extreme verdict going after Take Up My Bones, the first record, uh, on both mm -hmm. ends of the spectrum. So I was asked in the aftermath of Take Up My Bones whether I was a Catholic. Like, you, you must be a Catholic to have written this album. No. Um, oh, you are an arty. No. Like, I, and I had both of those reactions from the same record. Mm. And that just goes to show, I, I think I tread the line very well then, <laughs> right down the middle. But the, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, music fans are um, keyboard warriors sometimes, aren't they? Yeah, sometimes. And for all those keyboard warriors out there who wrote me last year after a certain interview at the end of December, <laughs> Um, Mark, yeah. but there is one question that I, I have to get there, and I hope you don't mind. Not As you did your PhD on, on uh, your uh, music PhD on that kind of topic, and as you were looking at the sound of bands, did you then find anything where you said, like, okay, that is a Finnish sound, that is a Swedish sound, or as I would <clears> presume you didn't? Well, I think that it's very difficult to f categorically say there is such a thing. Mm -hmm. But in the instance of Finnish bands, and only Finnish bands, I think okay. sometimes, well, maybe not only Finnish bands, but 
yeah, some of some finished bands. I think you can sometimes detect sort of like a morose element that is just a bit somber that you don't you don't necessarily get elsewhere, but I think it's intangible. I don't think we can convince ourselves there is such a thing other than some, well, another again, another concept that I wrote about in the PhD, imagined community. Mm-hmm. So this sociological con- concept of uh, imag- imagined community, we think we know what it means to belong to yeah. something, yeah. yeah, which I think is fascinating. And we can almost convince ourselves of anything in that, in that kind of scenario. And sport is another, is again, a great example. You really want to go there, right? Well, I just think it's a, I genuinely think it's a great comparison. If you've got 50,000 people in the stadium all supporting the same team, they all think that they are the same in that moment. Yeah. And in some ways they are, but in reality, it's a cross section of society that will have very different personal traits. Yeah. So, no, I'm, I'm going to say that no, um, there isn't really such a thing as a finished sound. But that, if there was to be any country that fell into that, maybe Finland. It's very interesting. I mean, when we look at certain metal collectives, there definitely can be something like that, but only because of the fact that I was just thinking of the Helvetic Underground Committee in, in uh, Zurich. I think it's Zurich. Those are like six or seven guys who play in... I think by now we're nearly counting like more than a dozen different projects. Well, of course, those 12 will sound alike because of overlapping personnel, but you still couldn't say like that is a Zurich sound. No. Because of course there are like loads of other people in that scene. I know what you mean. And then we're back at that imagined community. Hmm. I have to ask that now, you know, the football fan. Do you notice? <laughs> did you notice over the last couple of what is it? When when did the investor take over? At Newcastle was three years ago now. Yeah. So so did you notice a change in that cross section of society which believes they are one? Oh, wow. Didn't expect to be asked that one. Um I think Yeah, you brought up a sport yeah. all the time. I was just Yeah, no, I think that there is it's always the same when yeah you know, when a club becomes more successful or in any sport i think there will always be an influx of people who are like i want to see a team that wins so i'm going to follow yeah. this team but you know those of us who have followed the team since we were kids um and in newcastle's situ- uh, example have never seen our team win anything i mean the last never? yeah no, okay never. Well. the last Major trophy that Newcastle won was 1969. The last domestic trophy was 1955. The last league title was 1927. And you can see how easily I roll those d- dates off, right? Yeah. So the because notion... Because there are not that... <laughs> well, the, the, yeah, because yeah. the... So the notion that someone could come along and assist us to win a trophy, when most of all of us have ever wanted is to see yeah, yeah. one trophy in black and white stripes. Yeah. Yeah. We, you can you can bet the the bottom dollar that ninety percent of us are immediately emotionally invested in making this happen. Of course, but yeah, there there, there have been a small cross cross section of fans who've who've resisted it for sure. Mm. That's a different podcast, though, surely. <laughs> no, it's not a different podcast. It, it will not be cut. We don't cut your arm available sound. And for <laughs> all those American football fans out there, I have been to five different American professional American football stadiums in the U.S. It is nothing compared to Europe because you guys are not one unity. Sorry. Um, I love American football, played it myself, but it's not the same. Um, the only, the only uh, thing where in American football it's similar is in college football. Mm. But that is, you know, representative college. of the community a bit more, isn't it? Exactly. Exactly. Mm. And uh, if you, for example, have, have games on campus, I mean, like, okay. There, there are moments where it's very much like European football. Uh, I, I, you know, thinking, for example, of Penn State and their whiteout nights. But that is amazing. Let's go back to to music. Um, <laughs> we spend enough time on sociology and football. Um, when I listened to this record, um, you've already hinted at it. The songwriting process. 
you are writing songs or are you right you said you are writing several things at the same time are you then writing songs or is this more of a you're writing parts that later will be put together yeah they are it's the musical pieces of work the lyrics as i said earlier come, come much yeah. later um the i will usually have multiple sort of um sections that i'm sort of playing a jigsaw with so for example the the riff that starts the album the first riff in curse to nothing but patience i debated long and hard about whether that could be a first riff mm -hmm. and it, it was actually going to happen much later in the song for a while mm -hmm. um but i sort of uh thought i sort of i, I decided to go all in i, I w you, you shouldn't second guess people who are going to listen to the record should you should just go with your gut and i i did go with my gut in the end um, but I was like, oh, is that a bit of a prog rock, a prog riff to open an album with? Um, cause I, I find myself writing in strange times just sometimes without almost meaning to, um, but yeah, it's multiple pieces of music at the same time. And within each one, there will be, you know, multiple, um, multiple sections that, that get cast aside. And I, as I said earlier, I have several passes on the same song for months. Do you then also have songs that don't make it on the album at all? No. None. I was hoping you would say like, oh yeah, we'll have like a B-Sides collection coming up. Yeah, yeah, thank you for destroying my hope. No. Um <laughs> <laughs> No, it's those are the pieces of me. I mean, there are sections that were originally mm -hmm. meant to be in those songs that didn't make yeah. it. Yeah. But there's no there's no full pieces of music. Mm -hmm. They take too long. <laughs> I have a question. If you could choose a spot where to perform our music, do you have one in mind where you say, like, okay, performing it there? I mean, like, I know you played Huddersfield with, with an organ, didn't you? Yeah, that was pretty cool. I mean, I'm remarkably lucky with with Arth in that in a, only a small number of gigs, we've done some extraordinary experiences. You know, played Prophecy Fest twice, we've played the Cave of Balva twice. Yeah. Um, played the the show with the church organ in Huddersfield, which is extraordinary. Um, so, I mean, I think that I always said that I didn't want Arth to be a heavily touring band. I could never imagine sort of slogging this around the the sweaty rock clubs of Europe yeah. to to fifty people. It's yeah, it's wouldn't kind of, also wouldn't wouldn't work sound wise, right? It's, it's it's music that's befitting, I think, of an, of an occasion. So, yeah. I I would love to make Arth get off the opportunity to play at some of the big festivals um i think it's crying out to play something like inferno or, or, or something of that nature um but um th th there has been sadly little interest i guess in in having our live i've not said no i've i've said no to bit about two gigs ever far um, i think people sort of first of all didn't really realize it was going to be a live thing mm -hmm. um because it's so complex. It's got so many layers. How could this ever be pulled off live? Um, and, you know, none of us are young men. And the guys who helped me out by putting together the live band of Arthur are all in our mid-40s, mid uh, early to mid-40s. And so, you know, we've, we've got jobs, we've got families, partners, etc. So it's never going to be a touring pro uh, project. But I'd, I'd love to get it to some... What I found is people who have got into art have really got into it. It's a yeah. small fan base, but people have like deeply got involved in it. There's like there's some people who've been to every art gig, which takes takes some doing. Um, even though there's not been many, they've not been the, necessarily the yeah, easiest thing. Yeah, every to. is difficult, yeah. right? Um, but in terms of like places I'd love to play, like I mean, I can't imagine art would ever get this opportunity. But my dream venue to play. Anything art was always uh, the Royal Albert Hall. I mean, art is clearly never playing the Royal Albert Hall, but that that was the venue for for thirty years. I've wanted to play the Royal Albert Hall. I've played Carnegie Hall. I'm um, in New York, and when I accompanied a choir over there some years ago, ah, okay. um, so I, I'm, I'm able to sort of t have ticked that one off. Um, but yeah, I can't imagine any of my metal projects will ever get to Royal Albert Hall. Sadly, <laughs> yeah. I'll still keep my fingers crossed for it. So, Mark, <laughs> first of all, thanks for all the details into your work, into the record, into the You're lore welcome. behind it. But 
uh, everybody who's now listening to like what is this for 205th or something like that interview we're doing here uh, they'll know what what will come now nobody leaves a veil of sound interview without having to go through the infamous quick fire round at the end <laughs> you will always get two alternatives and you have to choose one of them okay and maybe give a short explanation on each um as you said that the first instrument you learned was the piano Mm -hmm. um, at five, if I understood you correctly. I'll give mm -hmm. you two of, let's say, the great pop piano players of the late 20th century. Oh. El Elton John versus Billy oh, Joel. Oh, God. Oh, God. I don't like either <laughs> of them. Don't make me choose between those. Right. Genuinely speaking, there are only two, possibly three piano players that I like at all. That might sound like a ridiculous statement for someone who's a piano player. I find no. it really oh. difficult to listen to piano. Because it's just so? too much of a day job kind of experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you know this might ruin my street cred in Metal Land, but the piano player who I love more than any piano player is Ben Folds. Doesn't ruin your cred. Doesn't ruin your cred. But still He's I said a, a phenomenal songwriter. If I have to pick one of those two, it'd be Billy Joel, because I can't stand Yes. Him. At least one person who knows music. Um Classical music. I I probably don't know Jack compared to you, so I'll be no. Two well, of you're going to be disappointed here as well because I've never listened to classical music either. See, I'll give you two <laughs> two Nordic uh, composers: Sibelius okay. versus Greek. I mean, I, I am making this choice without really any knowledge. I w I played in orchestras when I was a kid because I was a viola player. Mm -hmm. From when I was eight to eighteen, oh, so I was around, I was around orchestras when I was a ch when I was a kid, but I have not had anything to do with classical music for thirty years. So mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, I'm only picking Sibelius because I, I've got one or two other Fr Finnish musicians who love um, Finlandia, etc. So I'll go Sibelius. Okay, you've spoken about your love for for death metal and and stuff like that. So I'll give you. Or also like bands on on that brink between death and doom metal. I'll give you two of a classic peaceful bands. Oh well, this is Paradise, easy. Paradise Lost versus My Dying Bride. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. Right, so I deeply, could have given you anathema as well. You know, that would have like, been a much genuinely that would have been a much easier one to answer. Um, so I deeply love Paradise Lost and I deeply love My Dying Bride, and even though I now you know. I know Aaron from My Dying Bride, um, uh, having worked with him on one or two little things already. Um, and he's a deeply lovely guy, and I do very much like their music. But I have to say that Paradise Lost got there first in my heart because I remember exactly where I was and exactly what the moment was when I first heard Paradise Lost. And mm. they have been a band that has been part of who I am since I was 16. So whilst I love My Dying Bride, Paradise Lost came first for me, so it has to be Paradise Lost. So what was the first record by Paradise Lost that you ever heard? Draconian Times. When it came wow. out. Wow, that, that is a good one, but it's not even their best one. It's cool. I, I always love I mean, it, it when is, you... It is their best one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would I would make a case for Icon, but anyway. um, Yeah, Draconian Times, it was when it was coming out. I happened to be walking through a record shop that was playing it. I didn't know what it was. I stood and listened to it. It was an yeah, yeah. and it was it was the track Enchantment. So it starts with the yeah, piano. Yeah, and, and you and you. I was a teenager. I was like, "What? Yeah. Why is this piano?" And then it crashes in. I was like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" And yet, I've been. A, I and I, I, amazingly, just a few weeks ago, got to tell Nick and Greg that story because we they played Prophecy First with with R, and so I was very much like the gibbering fanboy at that moment. I can understand that. If anybody wants to know a little bit more of what Aaron. From my dying bride is doing in his spare time and he's not doing my dying bride go to our archives where we have an interview with his let's say second band at the moment high parasite yeah and he's and he's doing his poetry as well and he's but, doing his poetry as he told us you know he will be performing next year yes so everybody yeah, with who me no with me we're uh, doing it I together would have, in I, I would i would have come now now i'm i might <laughs> Yeah, we're both cool. going to be there. He didn't. He didn't say that. Um, Shocking. <laughs> well, um, as we were talking about Wadruna at the beginning, mm. uh, I'm I'm very very sure that you know that that Aina did the, did part of the soundtrack for Vikings. Mm. Now my question: Vikings, the TV show, 
Is that something you can dig? Yes or no? I've never seen it. Oh, it's okay. It's no. <laughs> <laughs> Is that shocking? Is that shocking? No, yeah, it's... So, sorry. No, it's uh, not. Yeah, I've, I've no, never seen it. Shocking. Don't worry. It's not shocking at all. I have three more um, music related questions. Okay. Um, and now let's let's make Costas angry. Pantheist. Oh, Solitude versus Kings Must Die. Which oh, one would you rather listen to right now? Oh, Solitude. Aha. Call of a Wretched versus Divinity of Oceans. You know, I just know that I love those first two records. I don't know if I could... I don't know if I know them deeply enough to choose between the two. So uh, I think I vaguely remember thinking the first one's my favorite. It's been a while. That would... That should be Call of a Wretched, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And as you spoke about your love for Alice in Chains, Dirt versus Jar of Bones. Jar of Flies, sorry. Jar of, Jar of, Jar of Flies. flies. Uh, it has to be Dirt. I mean, it's an absolute record for the ages. But I mean, I don't think they ever recorded a bad note. I also... Oh, even the they're... stuff before, like the 80s, where it was like oh, glam yeah, All right. Yeah, maybe that's not so great. But facelift onwards is untouchable. Yeah, um, yeah. But the, I think that their self-titled album doesn't get enough love. I think that is a fabulous That's true. record. That's true. I think it's the way that Dirt was just such a game changer for for music in general. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a ten out of ten record in every single way. Yeah, and it's basically a doom record. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it, it's like one of those bands when they're like. If Soundgarden, if Soundgarden were the punks, or like let's let, let's say like the avant-garde punks of, of grunge, and 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 Pearl Jam are the whiny sons, um, then <laughs> Alice in Chains is definitely the doom band out of all of those. Yeah, I I still find myself saying that Alice in Chains is my favorite band of all time. I I think that would not be a bad choice. It would not be mine, but I can understand that choice definitely. Certainly for someone who was sort of a teenager at that time and it's sort of stuck 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 with you all this time. I mean I I think that the records they're making now are I enjoy them, but I can't listen to it as the same band. I try I've really tried and I enjoy them, but then it's not the same for me. I, I think the only problem is that how should I say? Um we are so much used to Lane's voice. That anyone who tries to follow that, and even though William I mean, did some he, wonderful songs, yeah, but he is a fantastic it's, it's, singer. Yeah, he is, but it's it's not Lane. No, and as you said, think... like like voices overlapping like a choir, that is just very hard to do. Yeah, L Lane Staley's voice and Jerry Cantrell's voice intertwined is just unparalleled. To the point where, and this might come as a surprise. So when I used to be a music lecturer, I used to, you know, teach students how to play all kinds of different songs. And some students found out I was an Alison Chains fan. They want, oh, Mark, can we do an Alison Chains song? Because you know they were young and like discovering grunge and so on. And I really hesitated and said, oh, I don't think I can bring myself to teach you an Alison Chains song because it's just too much part of who I am yeah. and, and, they, and they, they wound me and wound me up and wound me up and ground me down and eventually I gave in and tried to teach them no excuses um, which was just obviously destined for failure um, and I remember listening to the harmonies on no excuses trying to work out how to teach them to these students and even with my I don't use this like term lightly but like expert ear I still couldn't pick apart which voice was which in some of the intertwining yeah. lines they overlap because no. it wasn't just like one voice was always higher than the other all the time no, no, no. they are sweeping around each other all the time yeah. it is extraordinarily rude yeah it's also as much as anything. yeah it is but also because you know when we talk about like great duos with awesome harmonies i think they're not giving enough credit you know we very often talk about some pop shit you know like whatever but those two guys had had a way of of working with each other that is unparalleled. Yeah, no one, no one's, but no one's better than that for me. Yeah, like, uh, as I said, it's not, it's not a bad choice, definitely not. Mark, thanks for all your time. No problem. At all. And Thank uh, you for in, having me. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And uh, for everybody out there, 
if you have not yet listened to Untouched by Fire, which is a shame. And I, I, I myself have to admit that I was a little late to the game. But if you haven't listened to Untouched by Fire yet, do so. It's out everywhere. You can pick it up via Prophecy Records. You can listen to it on Bandcamp, wherever you want to. But listen to it and uh, take your time. Um, it, it unfolds that's the, more that's and the more key. and more and more. Yeah, yeah. it's it's not to be dipped into. And that's fine. You know, people, we yeah, need a lot it's, of patience. It's not fast food. That's true. Mark, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.